So right now, the gaming industry has a bit of a learning problem, and I'll explain it in two quick examples. If I wanted to read Harry Potter, I'd have to learn about letters, words, and 10,000 grammar rules before I could read the first sentence. I could walk into Barnes and Nobles and find countless phonics books made for teaching people like me how to read. I could read them, become educated, and then I'd be literate in the English language. Now I can read Harry Potter. However, if I wanted to learn how to play Breath of the Wild, but I didn't know how to play video games, I'd have to learn about health, damage, saving, interacting, and so on. So I could walk into a GameStop and ask, Excuse me, sir. Hey, how's it going? Where can I read video games? Oh, well, I've got some information on this copy of Battletoads down here. <laughs> in this scenario, I can't become literate in what I want to learn. Because unlike the publishing industry, the gaming industry doesn't seem to have any phonics book style video games that teach new players all these different concepts. So I decided to make a free phonics book style video game linked below, and with it, I taught six people who haven't played any games outside of Mario Kart and Pac-Man how to properly move, shoot, and jump in a first person shooter all in about 10 minutes. And as the title suggests, I'm here to teach you how you can do the same. I'll talk about how to set up everything for a new player, since a normal controller might be a little difficult to use. I'll talk about what each section of my program is supposed to teach your new player, so if anything goes wrong, you'll know how to guide them to learn any necessary concepts they might otherwise miss. I'm Etra from Games for Non-Gamers, and before we start talking about my fancy program, I need to talk a little bit more about what video games and phonics books have in common. Phonics books teach new readers concepts like letters and words one at a time at a pace that isn't too boring or frustrating, keeping them in this nice little area that psychologists like to call a state of flow. Being in this state of flow helps keep the reader engaged with their material. In this phonics book-like video game, we want to use the same idea to help teach your new player how to look around, interact, walk, strafe, dash, shoot, and jump at a pace that won't overwhelm or bore them. But before you download and boot up the game, we need to do something to help with the fact that your new player has probably never held a controller before. In this case, our controller will be a mouse and keyboard. But just like any new controller, in between every single button press, our new player has to constantly scan their keys over and over again before they get used to playing. In a previous video, I found that if you label your keyboard and mouse with labeling stickers like so, you can greatly reduce the amount of time it takes your player to find the right buttons to press. So before you start the program, make sure to label the E key, shift, the left mouse button, and WASD as seen here with the key name and the action it performs. I used these Avery color coding labels that you can buy at basically any office supply store. But if you don't have five bucks to spare, you can just cut the bottom off of sticky notes, leaving just the sticky part of the note and label that. Just make sure to use something anything to label your keyboard before you begin. It is extremely difficult to keep a new player from getting overwhelmed when teaching any video game, so I highly recommend above all else that you label your keyboard and mouse in some way. In fact, it is so important, I'm going to put it as the very first thing on your brand new super duper important things to do list. Once you have the keyboard labeled, you can start the program. The first thing the program tries to teach the new player is how to look around and move in a 3D space without just staring at the floor, which seems to be an issue for any new player that tries to pick up a 3D video game. However, there is one 3D video game series that I've seen many new players play without any trouble, Mario Kart. One thing I noticed when looking for a way to fix this staring at the floor problem was that in Mario Kart, players can't look up or down. So I was like, hey, how about I do that? So the game starts with our player chained to this wall, and just like Mario Kart, they can only look left and right. We'll add looking up and down later. Up on the screen, I place two button prompts. One for looking around, and the other for interacting. So the players break these supports and let this chain fall. Then the chain explodes, so the player clearly knows they are free. Now, even though we are like five seconds into the game, there are already three issues that I found while testing that I couldn't fix in this version of the FPS program. So grab your list of important things and write this down. First, you will probably have to outright tell your player how to look right, even though it's on the screen here. Because when the program says look right, a player needs to do more than just simply move their mouse to the right, as this prompt implies. They have to move their mouse to the right, pick it up, place it back in the center, then move it right again. This movement is natural for most people who have played a first-person shooter game, and I didn't even think about its existence until I saw my older sister try to move the mouse around like this. So make sure to show your player how to lift up and reposition their mouse so they can actually get past this part. The second thing I should note is that outside of this very specific instance with the mouse, you probably shouldn't give your player any hints to figure out how to do stuff. 
Instead, you should let them figure out these mechanical puzzles by themselves. For example, let them figure out that they can interact with objects that glow. Don't point that out to them. If someone tells them exactly what to do all the time, the game will become boring. Simple discoveries like this can help a player stay in a state of flow and find the game engaging. But if they are truly stuck, you should nudge them along before they get too frustrated. Finally, on the topic of avoiding frustration, make sure your player knows that in order to progress in the game, they only have to do what's on screen. Green. Four of my six test subjects tried to break out of the chains by walking and jumping before looking all the way to their right or all the way to their left. Now don't worry about grabbing another page for your list because from here on out the game should teach them everything they need to know. After the player frees themselves from the chains, an arrow appears on this wall, pointing left, and a prompt appears for them to walk forward using W. The player should quickly learn to combine this new walking ability and what they learned about turning to walk forward and look left to face this door. They also should remember that glowing things can be interacted with, and since they know that most doors are made to be opened and closed, our player will press E to open this door. Next, the player walks right to demonstrate they can rotate 90 degrees both left and right with the camera. These stairs and then this fall show the player that they can move up and down in this game with the help of stairs or gravity. The player should reach a dead end, but will see light coming from behind them. This gives them a hint that they need to turn around a complete 180 degrees. It took around 10 seconds for each of the test subjects to figure out what they had to do here, but since they discovered this fact that they can turn around by themselves, instead of it just being told to them, seem to make them remember this mechanic a bit better for a later section. Next, the player presses these buttons which they are at eye level with to open these new metal doors, turning 90 degrees each time. This helps players get more used to rotating their character on the x-axis and walking forward. Once they walk through this door, the new player won't be able to look left and right, but only up and down. In this area, prompts for strafing also appear, and the player tests out the new concept with these walls right here. Finally, we have two buttons that open this door, which force your player to use strafing and looking up, and strafing and looking down to proceed. Once they exit this area, they're set in a more open room where they can look freely in any direction. And surprisingly, from what I've seen, being introduced to a 3D environment one axis at a time like this seems to completely solve the problem of staring at floors and running into walls. It's a bit anticlimactic, but from this point onwards, the six new players I had test the game seem to have no major issues navigating the 3D space. The player then tests all that they've learned about the 3D space so far by pressing three buttons to open this door. Initially, that's all I had in my prototype, but then I did testing for how your parents can play Deltarune and learned that the hardest thing for a new player in that game was learning how to press multiple buttons at once. You may have had an issue with this in the past if you tried to teach a new player how to play a platformer. Most likely, their jumps looked like this, with only one button being pressed at a time. My solution with Deltarune was to just force the players to learn how to use multiple inputs through seven painful minutes of brute forcing this button puzzle. But the action of pressing multiple buttons at once didn't seem to stick with the two people I had play Deltarune. It was especially concerning to me that they would still walk everywhere in the game because dashing was too difficult for them. Due to this, I decided to expand the prototype to teach the player how to use multiple buttons at once, since it is essential for many things in a first-person shooter, notably jumping and dashing. Also, a friend of mine pointed out that I should probably add a gun, so I started a live stream called Finishing the Game for Your Parents Are Dying, and the first thing I did was go back to when the player could only move forward, strafe, and look up and down. There, I added a treadmill to this hallway with no way to turn around and nowhere to go but forward. It forced my second group of test subjects to use the new dash button in combination with W to get to the next door. They proceeded through the game as normal, but when they get to the flower field, you'll see that I ever so slightly altered what was here before. I wanted to encourage the new player to dash without necessarily needing to. So I placed their next objective, grabbing this gun, all the way at the end of this field. I then placed a treadmill on this bridge to remind new players, hey, you can run. This reminder seemed to have helped my second wave of test subjects because three of them held down the dash button and ran from this point to get the gun, and the other two started dashing to their objective almost immediately after getting off the treadmill. After practicing how to use several inputs with dashing, the new player grabs the gun and simply points and clicks these two giant targets to lower this drawbridge. They cross it to find... Aye, 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 aye. Yes, with the dual input skills they have gathered, they must jump. 
a formerly painful trial for any new player. In the beginning, the player is in a safe environment where all they have to do is press W and spacebar to get up. Next, they have to use timing to make two small jumps over the unloving abyss. After that, the player encounters the final test of their abilities. First, they shoot these scattered targets to lower the drawbridge, only to find that life is cruel and the bridge is too far away and it has a treadmill on it that leads to death. So our player must walk forward, dash, and jump at the same time with correct timing to make it to the treadmill. But they're not safe yet and must continue to run so they don't fall into the void. Once they get to the top of the treadmill, the player must use their expertly trained interaction abilities, but surprise, the door won't open. This is no longer a very consistent bug I just couldn't fix. It's now a marvelous feature that adds emotions and excitement to the final moments of the game, since the only way the player can open this door is if they start falling to their doom and recover a bit. After their mini heart attack in the finale, the player enters this small room to get a little celebration tune and their very own victory cake. So now all you have to do is download the game below, grab your important things to-do list, and it seems you would be set. However, there is one thing I have to mention before you start. Even if everything goes perfect in the super specific program made for new players, I cannot guarantee that they can pick up and play any first person shooter with ease after this. To put it in perspective, even though you got your player through a phonics book, there's still a giant leap between something like that and War and Peace. Sure, our new player knows how to look around, walk, stray, fall, interact, shoot, and jump, which will most definitely make any first person shooter far less overwhelming, just like War and Peace would be far less overwhelming if you knew what words and sentences were. So I'm going to continue working on a better version of this program and a whole phonics game curriculum for non-gamers I have planned. I'm already finishing up a system in version 2 where gamers and non-gamers alike submit their playthrough data just by playing the game. So if you want to help me with that, subscribe and stay tuned. But for now, if you are going to use version 1 here, I would highly recommend watching this video where I modify Portal to make it playable for players who use this program, as well as talk about the many issues that may arise when guiding a player through a full first person shooter game. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you on the flip side.